Hi everyone, welcome to the MassNet Public Library. I'm Keith Walker, you may not be able to see me right now, but you're going to be seeing our slides in a minute anyway. Um, travel logs are one of the most popular things we do at the Public Library for our adult programming, and we didn't want to disappoint. We have this book for tonight, even though we can't open the doors and have you come to the library. We're hoping you we have a big crowd joining us in with us tonight. So, welcome everyone. Hope you're having a good evening tonight, and this is a little distraction for you from all the negativity that's going on in our world right now. And, kind of ironic that we're going to go around the world, but you can sit here at home and not have to worry about the COVID-19 virus. So, I'm starting with Newfoundland. Although, of course, the province is called Newfoundland and Labrador, my wife and I went to the island of Newfoundland last June. Um, and as you think of Newfoundland, you see icebergs, and we were not disappointed. June is probably the best time of the year to see the icebergs as they break off from the north and float past Newfoundland. I'm not a singer at all. Oops. Not a singer, so I apologize for what I'm going to do, but this is a song I learned in elementary. So, I survive the build the boat, and I survive the sails her, I survive the catches the fish and brings them home to lie, sir. Give your partner Sally to go, give your partner Sally Brown, fall with Tullagate Morgan's harbor all around the circle. That's, uh, believe it or not, a famous Newfoundland song that's sung usually much better than that. But it's interesting that we did not plan it, but we ended up going to those three places, Fogo, Tullagate, and Morton's Harbor. This is a map of the island of Newfoundland, and if I can do this from where I'm standing, we started in St. John's, which is down here on the corner of the Avalon Peninsula. Of course, St. John's is the capital of Newfoundland and the, the largest city by far. Um, the Avalon Peninsula is where the majority of people live, too. And interesting, before I show where we went, down here, I don't know if you, if you can even see it there, but it's interesting that there's the islands of Saint Pierre and Nicolas, which belong to France. In order to go there, you're on a little ferry from a small town in Newfoundland, but you have to have a passport, and they use euros, and it's France. We went to part of France. We didn't go there, though. We went from St. John's, and we went up on the Trans Canada Highway up here, and just off the side there. Bona Vista Peninsula, there's a little town called Lethbridge, and another one that's called Come By Chance, which we didn't actually go to, but you can go to Come By Chance. <laughs> we went up the island, and up to Bander, and then up over here to Fogo and Twillingate, as in that song. And then we came back down, and we went along here, and up the trans Highway, and then we went off the highway, and you go up this, it's called the Northern Peninsula, and this is where Grosse Moore National Park is, and I have some beautiful pictures of Grosse Moore, and it's a beautiful part of the country. And then up here, and these all look like big towns, like the same as St. John's, but they're actually little tiny fishing villages. One of those places you can blink and you miss them. But uh, it's beautiful to see all these little towns. And up here is where the ferry goes over to Labrador. We saw the ferry, and that's the closest we got to Labrador. And then we continued on, and going around the top of the, the Peninsula over to St. Anthony's, which is a neat little town, and then up a little bit further to Lonzo Meadows. And I'll have more to tell you about Lonzo Meadows, but that's at the very top of the Northern Peninsula. Then we came all the way back down because there's no other way to come back down. We don't usually like repeating, we like to go in a circle, but we have to come back down. And we came down here to Corner Brook and then up this way, and then all the way back around, stopped the Gander, and back down to St. John's. We did that, we had about two weeks in Newfoundland. Um, so Newfoundland, oops, a little foreshadow here. <laughs> Newfoundland has a distinct <laughs> dialect with some of the uh, famous sayings that Newfoundlanders say. They also have an accent. The accent is a mixture of southern Britain, southern England, Scotland, Ireland, and their own brand. When I was in Newfoundland a long time ago, there were, I was with three friends, and we stopped a man on the corner of the street in Porto Bass and asked him directions. Four of us listening to him, when he walked away, none of us could understand what he had said with his strong accent. But then they also have this dialect where they say these interesting things. They talk about mother and father and uh, things we can't understand. But um, this is one of my favorites. Stay where you're at, 
stay where you're to until I come to where you're at. Just use my little cheating note. This is how this would happen in conversation. Where are you at, me son? So where are you at now? Stay where you be at. I'll come where you at. So that means, basically, stay where you are, I'll come and meet you. I just, I love that kind of, that dialogue. Okay, on to our pictures. This is um, colorful downtown St. John's. Uh, really, every store has a different color, bright, welcoming. And this is a street just coming up from St. John's. All colorful. I think it's colorful because Newfoundland has some of the worst winter, some of the worst weather we have in Canada. We all heard about the terrible snowstorm they had uh, in January, where the St. John's was just covered deep in the snow. But they also have the worst fog, the worst wind, um, most amount of snow, like the worst storms of any big city in, or major city in Canada. So I think it's colorful to keep people cheered up. This was our first iceberg. We were very excited to see the iceberg. <laughs> it looks like now like a little blob of ice cream floating there near St. John's, but we took lots of pictures of that one because we were excited. <laughs> By the end of the trip, oh, there's another iceberg, but the first one is always exciting. Uh-oh. There it is. <laughs> okay, we have a few technical difficulties. Bear with us. <laughs> um, this is at Signal Hill. Um, yeah, let me just show you. Yeah, Signal Hill in um, the edge of St. John's. There are at least 500 stairs down to where we took that picture. 500 stairs back up. But beautiful scenery when you go down there, and that's where that iceberg was. Just across from there is the... Um, Lighthouse at the entrance to St. John's called the Narrows. Leads into the harbor of St. John's, and I don't know if you can see my red arrow here, but this is the harbor of St. John's, very protected by that little Narrows. This is the city with some high-rise hotels and office buildings. And up in there, if I can see right, is a big museum called the Rooms. It's sort of like the Esplanade. It has the theater and the museum, but much bigger than St. John's, the bigger city. A very interesting museum about life in, in Newfoundland. And oh, it went. Um, fast. <laughs> I think it skipped one, yeah. There you go. Okay, this is me at the Narrows. Um, it's a historic site, and across Canada now they have these red chairs that the national parks and national historic sites, which I think are great places to sit down and view. So I'm looking in all across the narrows of St. John's. This is um, Cabot Tower, which is at the top of those 500 stairs we climbed. This is, was built in 1897 to acknowledge the 400th anniversary of John Cabot's arrival in North America. It was also the, uh, one of the anniversaries for Queen Victoria it was built to honor her as well. Then a few years later, four years later, in 1901, the first uh, wireless transatlantic message was sent between England and North America and arrived by a Morse code, using Marconi's Morse code there at the Cabot Tower. This is the lighthouse at Cape Spear, which is the most easterly point in North America, not very far from St. John's, um, a major tourist place as well as a lighthouse. And another view of the lighthouse and overlooking the Atlantic Ocean. These are lobster traps as we're lined up on, a, on to get onto the ferry to go over to Fogo Island. And this is me on Fogo Island. And that is a famous hotel back there called the Fogo Island Inn. Mm -hmm. There are only 29 rooms. You can't park there, you have to park down below and they have a little shuttle bus that takes you up. And it's supposed to look like a Newfoundland building up on stilts. It is a very exclusive hotel. Each room is $2,000 a night. What? And in between June and August, you can a minimum of three nights you have to stay there. So $6,000 to stay in that hotel. We did not stay there. <laughs> Took a picture of me outside and instead. We stayed in this which is called Salt Box. And I think probably a better way to reveal and just as beautiful. So these are old fishermen's 
houses that are now made into cottages that you rent and get the whole house to ourselves. And this was the view from that front window, right onto the ocean. Chairs and picnic table. This was the next morning, a uh, fisherman out. And it was really interesting to watch him. I don't know, he was zipping back and forth, stopping and then zipping again. I don't know if he was getting lobsters or what he was doing, but interesting. This was a hike we went on Fogo. This is looking down onto the, one of the villages on Fogo Island. Uh, no trees, it's very typical Newfoundland. Lakes and lots of rocks. Mm. This was the view from our um, salt box in Twillingate. Another view right onto the ocean. Beautiful. And in the far corner, if you can see, there's a, a stuffed puffin just to welcome us to. We never actually saw a real puffin. This was the iceberg floating in the harbor at Twillingate. Twillingate is a really good place to see uh, icebergs. And this is a ship, a fishing ship just show you the size of that um, iceberg. And that blue is just natural. It looks like somebody painted a line on it, but it's just a natural part of the iceberg. This is a typical view of the Sea of Newfoundland. Um, this is Grossmoor National Park. As I mentioned, a really beautiful place. It's a national park that was only established in 2005, but now one of the major places of tourism in Newfoundland. This is Bal at Grossmoor. You see sort of the fjord kind of country in the background. This is um, Western Brook Pond at Gross Moor. I don't know why it's called Pond, because it's, uh, it's a lake and mm -hmm. it's beautiful. It, the mountains come straight down to the water. And there's boats that take you out and you go right up to the, the sides there. More of the red chairs in Gross Moor National Park, looking right onto the Atlantic Ocean. I have lobster. Oops. Had to have Newfoundland lobster. We did not, though, however, get take part in a screeching ceremony. I don't know if you've heard of those, but they're a tradition in, in Newfoundland using Newfoundland rum, which is 40% alcohol, pretty strong. Um, they do it to people who come from away, so otherwise mainlanders or the rest of us Canadians. <coughs> They do a short recitation, and then you kiss a fish, you kiss a cod. It's all part of the screeching in ceremony. I did the lobster instead. <laughs> this is Val in St. Anthony's, and it's just one of those luck things we have. We were there in St. Anthony's during the Iceberg Festival, just one week. It's the only Tim Hortons in all of Canada that serves iceberg donuts, and only that week. So that's what Val has, is an iceberg donut from Tim Hortons. <laughs> In St. Anthony's. What's it like, Keith? It's very sweet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of whipped cream. This is at the very top of the island, uh, up near Lonzo Meadows. Uh, another typical view of the of Newfoundland. This is Val with the snow. This is remember in June. It's the entrance to the Lonzo Meadows to, uh, Interpretive Center. So you can imagine how much snow. That was last year in audio and this year, how much snow they have. So this is the Interpretive Center at Lansom Meadows. Lansom Meadows was my favorite place. They have a reconstruction of a Viking settlement that was established a thousand years ago. So it just amazed me to think we were walking in a place where these Vikings lived a thousand years ago. The Vikings came over from Greenland and they made the settlement. They don't think they stayed in Newfoundland very long, but they must have explored further south because they had some um, fruits and grapes that were only grown in uh, New Brunswick. So they obviously had gone down further south, maybe to the St. Lawrence, and then came back up. They don't know if there were very many women there, but there were some signs of some domestic um, life there. But no one even knew this existed until the 1960s. Some people had thought that maybe the Vikings had got here earlier, but they couldn't find any signs to show that. And so then they, um, two archaeologists discovered this in 1960 and proved that the Vikings had been there. For some reason, the Vikings left, and when they left, they burned the whole village down. They didn't want anyone to know they'd been there. So it took that long. Anyway, it was just amazing to think the Vikings had been there. This was also near there where they figured that the indigenous people of North America met the European people for the very first time, which I also thought was fascinating. This is a replica of a Viking boat, boat which would have taken them from 
um, Iceland to Greenland to Canada in one of those kind of boats. Not very big. Um, I like to think that this is, um, well, Eric the Red and Keith in the Blue, but it's not. It's Lee Erickson. Um, they figured, they're not sure if the Erickson actually came to Canada, but it, they could. It's around the same time that he lived. Um, they do know, or they found that there's um, signs that one baby was born in Newfoundland. So it must have been. So it must have been. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is an island in Fog from Lonzo Meadows. And then as we're coming back down, we ran into just a cove, and there's all these what they call growlers, little pieces of ice that are broken off from bigger, bigger icebergs. So the iceberg is melting as it gets into the warmer water. But it's fascinating all the different sizes of icebergs. And that's, I think, a beautiful picture of the blue and the interesting shape of the iceberg. Just to show that there was some sun in the flat, <laughs> sunglasses on, our coats off, this is in Gross Moor. And this is in Deer Lake and, and shows the sunshine in Newfoundland, but also a little bit of their sense of humor. Because that says, Welcome to Joe Butt's Lookout. And Joe Butt is a village, too. It's not a famous person, but we thought our sons might like that. <laughs> this is in Gander, the Gander Airport, which is um, an interesting place as well. Gander was a stopover for all transatlantic flights up until the well, 1960s. All the flights going over to Europe had to stop in Gander to be refueled. And so they had this big terminal where the people got out, and lots of famous people had their pictures taken, and their pictures were up, and they autographed them for them. But then when the planes were able to fly without stopping, the airport really went into not being used very much, except it is still an emergency stopover. If if a uh, pilot has to you know, bring somebody back or being sick or there's uh, some um, emergency on board, they will still come back to Gander. And of course, the most famous part of Gander's history was in 9-11, when there were um, almost 7,000 passengers diverted from American Airlines uh, into Gander because they weren't allowed to land in the, in the United States. Gander only has 10,000 people, and they took in 6,000 people. And it's just, it's heartwarming to read the stories about how these people welcomed these Americans and other people into their country, into their city, brought them food, got them clothes, got them in all the hotels and the schools. It's an amazing story. And the American people were so appreciative of the, the Gander people that they have come back for reunions, they set up uh, funds to help their kids go, go to Ontario University. Anyway, they don't use this part of the airport, or they weren't going near there. I have read since that they're talking about reopening this part. But you can see it's left in the looking like the 1950s. <laughs> Back in St. John's, we went down to where my hero, um, Terry Fox. This is where he started his Marathon of Hope. So there's a statue there commemorating the start of his run. This is just a little ways out of St. John's. The last night we were there, the fog mist, which is rolling in, and beautiful sunset to say goodbye to us in Newfoundland. And I have to end with one picture, I'm a librarian. <laughs> There's a public library. Thanks. It's not very clear because we actually took it from Girona the boat, and down there on the end, we saw a library, but take a picture of the library. <laughs> so that's our picture of Newfoundland. So that was our trip to Newfoundland. I highly recommend it. Um, we flew by WestJet, although back a year ago we still had Air Canada. And we got to the Nelson Airport and the WestJet had been some problem and they immediately put us onto the Air Canada flight. Can't do that anymore because Air Canada stopped flying from Nelson as of today, I think. But anyway, we had good service from WestJet and a uh, great trip. Well, welcome back everyone, or welcome to our public library travel log via social media while we're social distancing. We had our first attempt at 7 o'clock, and we did Newfoundland, and it went okay. And then we had some technical glitches, so we have moved out of the theater at the library, and we're now in the training room, and I'm pretty sure we have all the technology ready to go, and we're going to turn it over to Peter, who has taken us to Mexico. So, welcome, Peter. Thank you. So, February, as you can see on the screen, uh, we went to Puerto Vallarta, the second year that we went loved it there 
Uh, it was an all-inclusive. This is the Sheraton, um, and we uh, we stayed almost at the top floor, so our view of the ocean was amazing. There it is. Uh, and you can see the pool area, the beach area. The beach area is not as good as it uh, normally was. They had a, a storm, and the storm eroded the original uh, sand, and um, so it's kind of pebbly, as you'll see when we get closer to the water. Uh, but still, a very, very wonderful stay in February. Way better than being in Medicine Hat in February. So there is Gwen, who can't stay away from water. She's a natural aquatic champion. And uh, you can see the beach is kind of coarse there. Uh, I almost dropped my camera in the, uh, in the water. I walked up to the, uh, the, the ocean to try to get a picture of Gwen swimming, and the rocks were so hard on my feet that I sort of started to stumble and just about fell into the water. Save the camera, though. <laughs> Bit of culture. Uh, very, very talented musicians. Really enjoyed that. Uh, and the leader himself was very charismatic. Uh, spoke to everyone, made everyone feel good. Uh, the last night uh, of our stay, they had a big festival in one of the areas. And uh, um, it was just an amazing thing. Very, very professional. And all for free. Well, free. <laughs> in a manner of speaking. And you found music elsewhere in uh, Puerto Vallarta as well. Here we are at uh, Cheeky Monkeys, I think it is, and uh, musicians came up and danced around us, and uh, of course they didn't do it for free, but it was just a very nice touch as well. And there is the uh, Melicon, uh, sort of a walkway that goes along the ocean. Um, always full of people, always full of all kinds of vendors, um, and uh, just an amazing thing to do, just to walk back and forth on the Melicon. You can go for, I think, 10 kilometers or so. Uh, so it's a really nice, nice walk. Uh, the Melicon is populated by a whole bunch of brass statues of all kinds of grotesque and wonderful images. Uh, this being one of them, uh, you can try to do your own interpretation of what it actually is meant to say. More of the Melicon. Uh, usually, in, in normal years, it's, it's very, very filled with tourists, and there's uh, anything and everything that you want to buy, and lots of bars along the way as well. And then you have this strange thing, a great big pole about 100 feet up in the air. Uh, four men climb up there, tie their feet together and then twirl around and as they're twirling around they're unraveling the ropes which hold them uh, and they go closer and closer to the sand and eventually they're on the, the ground. Uh, I'm not sure what that's supposed to do or who pays them to do that but it's fascinating to see. And there's the famous church with the steel, steel cupola on it uh, and uh, it's right in downtown Puerto Vallarta. That's the nice thing about this part of Mexico, this particular area, uh, is wonderful as far as I am concerned, it, because you're really in Mexico. You're not in, uh, you know, an island of a Western culture. You're, you're in Mexico, uh, not just in your resort. That's the inside of the famous church. Won't say much about the gold and where it came from and all that sort of thing. You can make up your own stories. This was a funeral which made me feel like this. <laughs> Walking right through somebody's funeral and uh, you know, not knowing it. <laughs> uh, then we took a 20 minute water, water taxi ride to another area called Las Animas. And it was just an undeveloped, beautiful beach. And on the way, we saw some porpoises. We also saw some whales, but didn't get close enough uh, get close enough to take the pictures. But these are porpoises, and it's just a great thing to see. This is the beach we were talking about. Uh, very, very few people. I'm not sure why. It, there's no hotel there or any place to stay, but a lot of restaurants. So here's a few scenes of Los Animas. Just idyllic, just beautiful. 
Uh, and the best shots have been missed. The, the, the computer program messed up on uh, I messed up on uh, me just just before I came here. And so this is uh, Glenn and a whole bunch of other semi-nude people going scuba diving, getting ready to go scuba diving. And uh, it was a very cold day that day, and they were all supposed to go from the boat uh, to that cove over there, and they all did swim over there, and they spent about 10 minutes there turning blue, and then the boats went in to get most of them back. They really were blue when they came back. <laughs> Especially the... Anyway. So Porta Vallarta is, is built on the side of a mountain or mountains, and uh, the hills are wonderful to just walk right up. It's perfectly safe as far as I can say, and, uh, and beautiful scenery, traditional buildings, lots of restaurants up there as well. Very steep. I don't know if I'd want to drive a rented car in, in downtown Porta Vallarta, but as you can see, there's a great, great slanting as you go up. <laughs> and walking is fun too. <laughs> yeah, very, very beautiful town with lots of places to stay. We tend to go there, we want to go there next year. I think we will rent uh, somebody's apartment instead of staying at an all inclusive, um, just so we can be more with the culture and away from tourists, basically, <laughs> even though I am one. Picture. So just the uh, the area of uh, Puerto Vallarta uh, on the sea, on the ocean, on the bay, lots and lots of hotels for uh, for the tourists. Uh, but you can also spend time, as I say, in the city and uh, see real culture. Beautiful art. They paint their houses. I mean, really paint their houses like this. Yeah. And there's an awful lot of uh, the women of Puerto Vallarta, you could say. Uh, just beautiful. So I have a few of those, um, and they're all over the place. They're just on, on buildings, and it's really fun to see. I thought this girl looked like the other girl that we just saw. So, mm. and she was smiling, and she sold me a hat. <laughs> uh, and then you have this thing about um, death, and people who know more about Mexico would be able to explain that. Uh, but there is a celebration of death. Uh, so you see these figurines in quite a few stores. And there's a bit of wildlife. This one was on our, our porch. Uh, this one wasn't. I thought that was a nice shot. Everyone. So I'm going to tell you about uh, two little trips that I took a few years ago. So the first one, it was actually kind of a crazy story, but um, I was in Bright Creek a few years ago and I was doing a stained glass workshop with two of my friends. And when we were there, uh, Robert Bateman, you know, the famous painter was there and he was like signing books and stuff. So we went and said hi. And uh, my friend being a little, my friend just uh, showed him a few paintings that I did and he said, oh, that's neat, you should come to this uh, workshop I'm doing next year out in Hollyhock in BC. So I have the book here that he signed and um, you can see that he autographed it here and I won't put it here, but he put his assistant's email in there so I could get in touch with her. <laughs> So, um, after hooming and hawing, because it's like Robert Bateman and stuff, um, I decided that, you know what, whatever, I was going to go. Because when do you get a chance to learn from a master? So, this is the group that went that year. Um, I am actually in the back corner right there. You can't see my head at all. It's fine. It's great. <laughs> this is the only picture of me from the entire weekend. Oh, no. <laughs> but I, I first assured I was there. So if you're wondering what kind of paintings I do, I do realistic kind of like acrylic paintings and uh, Robert Bateman has always been one of my style influences just because he's a very successful contemporary painter that kind of looks at things with a more realistic edge. So even though I don't paint wildlife, I love his style. So um, the workshop was at Hollyhock, which is in uh, coastal BC on Cortez Island, kind of like over here. So it was a little bit of a process to get there. 
I had to fly from Calgary to Victoria, and then I had to fly from, um, then I went to Campbell River, and then I had to get in a car and go to a ferry terminal where I had to meet up with two complete strangers from Toronto to get in their rental car so we could take two ferries and get out to Cortez Island. It was great. Um, just a random airport shot. And this is a ferry terminal. At this point, I had been dropped off, and I was just waiting for these two strangers that I'd only ever talked with online to show up. It was a little bit nerve-wracking. This is a picture I sent to my husband as I was waiting. They were a little bit late at this point. <laughs> but um, this is David and Jill. They were great. They were from Toronto, and they had come to also learn from Robert Bateman. We had a great little weekend together. So, um, Cortez Island is on co in coastal BC. Um, you know, pretty trees, pretty rocks, all that fun stuff. And um, Hollyhock was kind of like this island retreat that was a little bit off, off the grid and people went there, um, a lot of meditation workshops and wellness workshops and stuff like that. But I guess um, he would have workshops out here because um, of the nature and it was so quiet and idyllic and all that fun stuff. It was a really, really busy um, seminar. As you can see, there was, really wasn't that much downtime at all. It was like talk, lunch, talk. Um, and there were all these wonderful things to do and not really any time to do it. <laughs> this is where I stayed. Um, because I was trying to like kind of go on a budget, they had these like cabins that maybe six people would stay in at a time. But because this was like the last event that they had for their season, it was just me and this other lady and then two other ladies for most of the time. And it was really nice. My roommate was pretty interesting. She had some stories. And um, the scenery was honestly really beautiful. I took so many pictures and I just really enjoyed being in coastal BC. Um, so this was um, part of like the vlog where everybody ate at. And uh, just another view of like the common building where people would go and they would eat and they would hang out and all that fun stuff. Lots of food appreciation. Um, the best part of Hollyhock was definitely the food. It was like um, pretty much vegetarian. It was all homemade. Stuff was grown in their garden. I took pictures of everything I ate. It was great. <laughs> Uh, here's a picture of, I just took a few random pictures while he was talking. Um, he basically went over some common art history, things that he um, felt like were good with art and things that were bad with art. And we also got to see him demonstrate how he paints some of his like famous grasses and all that other fun stuff. And then um, he had a few um, paintings that were in progress too that um, people wanted to get pictures with. <laughs> And just some more pretty coastal scenery. At one point, um, we, we'd go out for these walks and he would just kind of like show us the landscape and what he would find was interesting and just like great ways to compose a painting and things like that. I took a lot of random pictures. <laughs> he would talk to us in the lodge too. The coolest, most interesting thing that I got out of this whole experience was that he really emphasized that you don't need a master's in art history to be a good painter. All you really have to do is just work and practice your craft. It's good if you want to understand like the background behind what you're doing, but um, taking like six years of school won't make you a pro painter. You have to put in six years worth of work. So for me that was really reassuring because I just have like an applied um, bachelor's degree from the college with my art and I had always kind of worried that you know maybe that's like not good enough to be a legitimate artist and it was kind of reassuring to hear that from someone as legendary as him. And these are just some random pictures I took when we had two hours of free time so I tried to go for a little walk around the island. Yeah, I would totally recommend going there and staying in an Airbnb. Um, the oysters were really good. <laughs> um, and Hollyhock had this like big garden that's pretty famous, so I took some pictures um, of everything that was in there too. And that was just the ferry ride on the way back. I really enjoyed all the food, but I was super happy to have fried food on the way back. These were some really good fish and chips that we had in Campbell River. Okay, so now to lead into that, I'm just going to talk about this little trip I took to Vancouver quickly. So, um, I have been friends with Jacinda over here, 
for over 10 years. So to celebrate our grand anniversary, we decided to go to Vancouver on a budget. We stayed at the Camby Hostel. It's pretty famous. Um, we felt a little bit old when we were there because a lot of people that stay there are in their early 20s, like whatever, but the price was great. <laughs> they had a cat there. He was oh. adorable. <laughs> And um, it was just really nice, like, going around Vancouver and seeing some of the scenery. We went to um, Chinatown. And uh, we went and had this really, really good ramen at this uh, restaurant called The Ramen Butcher. I would totally recommend it. <laughs> and uh, we also went and we ate at this uh, shop that had multiple kinds of gelato. It was really, really, really good. This was a bar in the Camby Hostel. Um, I believe they've been open for over 100 years now. Um, it was kind of sad when we were there because they were saying that they might close due to um, some kind of dispute with the landlord, but I, I saw on Facebook that they're staying open, so I am glad to see that. It was a little, it, um, I was worried about birds coming in because the windows were just like open like that and I didn't yeah. know if they'd come and fly in. Uh, but they had really good breakfast. And if you were staying at the hostel, you got breakfast for half price. It was a great deal. <laughs> and uh, um, the Canby Hostel is in Gastown in Vancouver, so lots of great places. We could just leave the hostel and just go walk to Starbucks and come back in a few minutes. We mm. went on a bicycle ride around Stanley Park the next day, which was fun. Here's some random pictures I took of that. <laughs> More random pictures. And of course, you can't go to Vancouver without going to the aquarium. I would told, I love what they do. Visit there if you have the chance. Oh. And of course, you're not going there if you don't try and take a picture in front of the jellyfish. <laughs> I had really expensive coffee. <laughs> and of course, we went to Granville Island just kind of walked around there, saw some scenes, went to the public market, and ate some really good seafood. I did a lot of sketches as well. It was pretty fun. And we went to a big art supply store. One day we took the ferry to go out to Victoria, which was fun. I know I've said it, it was fun a lot. I'm better in behind a camera than in front of it, but... <laughs> More food appreciation. Oh, wow. One fish, two fish, red fish, blue fish. You might have seen it on TV. It's great. And um, we went to the Bateman Center, so that's how I tied these two together. Again, totally recommend going there. And we also went and we just walked and took some public transport and saw different areas of Vancouver. We went to the art gallery, saw a lot of obscure art, some of it I couldn't really post on here because it was a little bit weird, but... Yeah. And uh, we went to the Big Lush store, it was great. <laughs> and uh, just a little more food appreciation. <laughs> Seafood was great. And, uh, yes, I forget what this was called, but um, it was really good. It was right by the seafood place. And of course, we had to go see the Vancouver Public Library. They had a rooftop garden, isn't that cool? And we went to the night market. Oh, cool. Yeah. Again, ah. really good food. And these are just some sketches I did while I was there. And that's all I have to tell you guys. All right. So, I am taking us to London and Sicily. Uh, my mom and I went on a trip, first London for four full days, and then Sicily for five days. Um, so, we booked this great little VRBO in London. It was near the Tower of London, near Tower Bridge, uh, by the Shard. That's the view from the balcony of the Shard. It had two bedrooms, which was perfect, all we needed, looked really great. But, <laughs> as we were driving to Calgary to fly out to London, we got a call from the homeowner. So a VRBO is like an Airbnb for those of you who don't know. 
um, we got a call from the homeowner saying there was a pipe that burst and the apartment was flooded and was inhabitable. So great, we're literally on our way um, to fly out, so where were we going to stay? So this is like the only time I've actually been thankful to have a three hour drive to the airport because my mom was driving, I was able to call the people at VRBO and try and get it all figured out. Um, good news is that VRBO has amazing customer service. So one thing I'll note as I was waiting on hold, I found out they're actually pronounced Verbo. <laughs> they, they kept saying it on the hold thing, Verbo, we'll be right with you, whatever. So anyways, I still call it VRBO because that sounds weird to me. Um, but by the time I got through to someone, they already had a file started and they were already trying to find us a new place. So um, what ended up happening though is that we couldn't get a place similar to the one that we wanted. So they said, hey, we actually have a partner hotel in Piccadilly Circus. You can stay there instead. So we were like, oh, well, we've heard about Piccadilly Circus. That was on our to-do list as well. So where the red little bubble is, is where the hotel was, and then where the uh, stars are is all places that we wanted to go and that we did go. So basically it was within walking distance of a bunch of stuff that we wanted to do. So perfect, it worked out. And here's some shots of what the hotel looked like, which is actually a lot better than what the cute little VR video looked like. So it worked out. And we didn't have to pay extra, it was just all the same price. So. So we're happy, we're on the plane, we're on our way, gonna sit on the plane for you know eight hours or whatever. And then when we finally got there, got to Heathrow, took the high-speed train uh, to Piccadilly, we came up from the underground and this is what we saw. So for those of you who, have, who haven't been to London, uh, Piccadilly is kind of like um, Times Square, I, I would say, but like an old English version of it, and it's amazing. There's people everywhere, lots to do, a pub every second store, basically. Um, so we decided, we got in in the afternoon, we figured we better stay up as long as we could and, you know, kind of get on London time. So we wandered around that first day, we found the telephone booth and did the requisite touristy photo right away. Um, and then the next thing we did was stop at a pub, <laughs> obviously. Had to have a drink to refresh, so we stopped at J St. James Tavern, which is a cute little place uh, right in the heart of Piccadilly. Um, and then we just kept walking a little bit to explore some things. This is St. James Park, and you can see on the photo on the right there, uh, the London Eye you can see from St. James Park. It's across the Thames, but still it's, it's there. Um, so then we kept walking and we were like, well, we better check out the Westminster area. We were close enough to walk to it. We knew we were going to go back the next day and check out Westminster Abbey. So we just wanted to make sure we kind of got our bearings. Um, what we didn't realize is we were walking into a Brexit demonstration. Oh. <laughs> and there was cops everywhere, cops on horses. Like, people were really angry. There's this guy presenting on the TV and he's screaming and he's trying to rile people up. And, everybody's angry and we're like oh my gosh what is happening get us out of here so we went and went back to Piccadilly after that uh, but we did come back the next day when there wasn't a demonstration happening and went to Westminster Abbey which is pictured here um, unfortunately you can't take photos inside I really wish I could because this was the highlight of the trip for me um, if you don't know, Westminster Abbey is a royal church. It's also a world heritage site, and it's been home to every coronation since 1066, and it's also um, housed 16 royal weddings. Um, there's beautiful works of art, there's stained glass, there's the tomb of the unknown soldier, which is kind of roped off, but you can pay your respects. Uh, there's lots of people buried there, uh, 3,300 in fact. Um, lots are British royalty uh, and monarchs and things like that, but there's also Sir Isaac Newton, Charles Darwin, William Shakespeare, Jane Austen, the Bronte sisters, so it's kind of cool to, you know, know that they're there in their eternal resting place and you can kind of see that, so that was really neat. Uh, and right by the Abbey is Big Ben. Unfortunately, they're 
refacing it or whatever they're doing to it. So it's all covered in scaffolding. You can't even tell that it's Big Ben really, except the clock face. Uh, but it was cool to kind of stand underneath it and just see how big it is. Um, and then, so that pretty much took care of a day, just wandering around in Westminster. The next day we got on a boat and went down the Thames. Um, this is on the left, a photo of the London Eye, now we're closer to it in this photo. And then on the right is the Shard, uh, which is one of the tallest buildings in London, and I'll show you photos later, we actually went to the top of it and got some cool shots of around the city. Um, so this is the first place we went when we got off the boat. The, sorry, the photo's kind of blurry, um, but this is the Tower of London and the Tower Bridge behind it. So this was a fortress, basically. You can walk along, when you go there, you can walk along the outer walls. And everywhere that you see green grass around it used to be water. So it was basically a moat, uh, harder for people to get in. They could cut off bridge access. Uh, the entrance is like way over in the corner there. Uh, they could cut off bridge access and then it'd be harder to get in, obviously. So a little more um, protected. So this is the entrance to it. And then this is another shot of where you can kind of are on that outer wall, basically. And then you can see the bridge right across. Um, this building, I'm not exactly sure what it was in the whole area. There's, you know, the tacky tourist headsets that you can wear and learn all the history. We did that, uh, but I can't remember it. <laughs> um, and then on the right is my mom next to one of those giant ravens that they have there. Um, I'm terrified of birds, so I got nowhere near <laughs> the ravens. Um, but apparently legend has it that if the ravens should leave the tower itself and the whole kingdom will fall. So they do a good job of making sure the ravens stay there for that reason. Um, a, a thing I wrote down here too was that the Tower of London was constructed in the 1070s by William the Conqueror. Um, obviously he wanted to build a stone fortress to defend against his um, royal power. It took almost 20 years to complete, and lots of kings and queens have lived in there since, obviously. And several murders and executions have happened there, uh, which kind of has led to the belief that it may be haunted. Uh, so here's a shot of us actually walking across Tower Bridge, which is just so amazing. It's like, you can't believe it until you're actually on it, how beautiful and gigantic it is. I don't know. It's, it's just amazing. Um, and then here's a shot of us walking closer to the shard so you can actually kind of see how big that building is. And this is the shots from the top floor of that building. So on the left you'd be looking over at like British Parliament and Westminster Abbey and, and Piccadilly Circus and all of that on the left. And then on the right would be looking back at uh, Tower of London and, and Tower Bridge. So there's us with our really expensive champagne. I think that was like 20 pounds a glass for that champagne. I know, but everyone had it. We were like, oh, well, we're only here once, so we'll get the champagne. Um, and then it was kind of funny because it was obviously like a date spot for many people. So they had this like beautiful flower arch and we're like, oh, well, let's go take a photo of the flower arch, even though we're not on a date. But anyways, uh, the next day we went to Buckingham Palace, which is obviously a spot you want to hit if you go. There's really not much to do there because like they obviously the Queen lives there you can't go in her house and look around so you just kind of hang out outside but we did get to catch the changing of the guard which was really cool. We got there early and we were like right up at the front so we could actually see a lot of people because there's so many people that go they don't even get to see it at all they just kind of see the guards at the end which is kind of a bummer so we got lucky. Um, they, that's them playing um, it, it's an Eric Clapton song, which I laughed so hard, I'm like, is the Queen a fan of Eric Clapton? I don't know. So anyways, they, they play a couple different songs and, and then change. Um, so from there we walked through Hyde Park, which is amazing. It's huge. I couldn't believe the size of this park, like just so much green space. Um, and then at the back of it is Kensington Palace. Um, and the statue in front is of Queen Victoria, who was born in Kensington Palace. And lots of royal families have lived there since, including uh, Prince Charles and Princess Diana. 
and this is wallpaper that was on one of the spots in Kensington Palace and um, it's just really cool representations of Princess Diana I thought and it's so bright and colorful but I would put that in my own house uh, here's just a shot of one of the bedrooms. You can actually go into Kensington Palace, uh, unlike Buckingham. So uh, that's just one of is how royal it looks, and you know, and then that's a view out to Hyde Park from that bedroom. Uh, we did go to a couple museums. Uh, we only had four days, so we had to do things quickly. But we did go to the Victoria and Albert Museum, which was beautiful. This is um, one of the areas you walk into and it's kind of the older like there's you can see the sarcophagus there and stuff uh, but pretty amazing lots to see there lots from around the world um, and then we went to Tate Modern which is a modern art museum um, I don't think I understand modern art because <laughs> I don't get this I don't get why this is art like this was one display on its own and then the second picture was another display <laughs> I, I don't get it. I don't know. Tate was, uh, we got through it pretty quick because we, we didn't stand to appreciate much of it, unfortunately. But I'm sure other people appreciate it a lot. Of course, I had to throw in some requisite <laughs> food photos. This is fish and chips with mushy peas. And as far as I'm concerned, mushy is the only way you should eat peas because that was delicious. Um, and then on our last night, we went to um, to see Aladdin, the musical, at Prince Edward Theatre. So that was pretty neat. Um, and then we were off to Sicily. So this is a photo from the plane. Um, you can see Mount Etna in the back, the volcano on Sicily, in Catania. And on the right is a, just a photo from our bus of kind of the coastline there. And then we got to the hotel. We stayed at the St. Andrea, the Belmont. Um, this is a photo on the right of just the chairs laid out on the beach and stuff right at the hotel. We were there in April though, so it was um, a little chilly still. We definitely weren't, you know, sun tanning. This is a view from the water of the hotel, which is just so adorable. And this then is a view from our balcony. It was super <laughs> nice just to like hear the waves splashing at things. So. Uh, just a couple more photos from the hotel. I, I just thought the view was amazing. Um, so we stayed, we were in Catania, like I said, and we stayed um, just at the base of Terramina, which is like a city uh, square basically built into a mountain. So there's lots of little shops, there's restaurants, there's lots to do up there. It's kind of like that old uh, if you've been anywhere in Italy, you'll know like this narrow streets and everybody just walks down and stuff like that. It was, it was sort of like that. Uh, so we were across the gondola. Our hotel was just right across the street from the gondola, which takes you up to Terramina. So that's a photo of obviously a, a gondola car that was behind us. And then that's the view from the gondola there on the right. And another view from the gondola. So you can see like everything's built right into the hillsides there. That's our crew on the gondola. <laughs> and then us when we got up to the top and that one's just another view of the top with the palm trees. So this is kind of what you would see when you get up to Terramina. Uh, like I said, just kind of narrow streets basically. No one's driving up there. On the outer part they are driving. Uh, but once you get into like the little alleyways, it's just walking, except the guy on a scooter apparently. Um, on the right is a restaurant that's kind of like you have to go up the stairs, and then the seating area is to the left. It's really cute. And again, another restaurant on the left there. Um, that was about midday when we walked by, so everyone was having their siesta. <laughs> so that's why there's no people there. Um, on the right was a beautiful church. I think it was called uh, Church of St. Joseph, that one. Uh, food. So obviously there's so much food in Italy and it's all delicious. On the left is the best cannoli I've ever had. Like, I don't even like cannolis very much here when I've had them, but that was amazing. On the right is an antipasti platter that we had at a winery. And the winery was Benenti. So this is a photo of us at the Benenti Winery. 
Uh, this gentleman on the left, him and his twin brother own the winery and run it. Uh, it used to belong to his fa their father um, and now he's retired. So they've taken over and uh, they were telling us here a little bit about the wines and the process and all the things like that. Uh, and I should note an interesting fact is that this winery is on Mount Etna, that active volcano. So that volcano is one of the highest in Europe and it's the most active, one of the most active in the world. So the reason why their wines are so delicious, which they really, really were, is because all of that the eruptions that have happened over time have made the soil really rich so these it's just like the smoothest wine you can imagine and they also have what they were serving us there was a sparkling like champagne basically it was so good <laughs> so then um they kind of tour you around tell you about their process but then they take you into their little dining room area and served us that antipasti that I showed you before and you got to have like all of us I think had three different glasses going like one for sparkling one for white one for red it was fantastic so the that's a photo if you see those wines anywhere I haven't yet I tried I looked around Calgary to try and find it I haven't find, found it anywhere yet so if you do see it grab a bottle for sure and also let me know <laughs> where I can buy it myself um, and then this was another winery we went to on Etna as well, and it was called the Barone de Villagrande. Um, and the thing that struck, it was kind of the same process, they told you how the wines are made and then they fed you a little bit and, and gave you a bunch of wine. Um, but the thing that struck me as really cool about this one was those giant barrels. I don't know if you can tell like the scale, but those people standing down there, I was standing up high. Um, they're like half the size of one of those barrels so it's just insane the amount of liquid that must go in there um and then we were lucky enough the next day to do a cooking lab with pietro diagostino i his name sounded familiar to me from before i don't know maybe i'm just crazy but um he's got this little cooking lab in Terramina, so you get to go he teaches you a bunch of stuff he brings people up even so that you can work with him and then he makes a four course meal for you um unfortunately i <laughs> came down with some sort of 24-hour bug as well as many people that were on this same trip with us they also got sick so i don't know what happened or what made me sick but I was fighting through that as we were here, so I didn't get to try any of this delicious looking food, so I can't even tell you how good it was, but everyone I was with said it was really good. So some sort of fish here, both of those, um, and then that was a pasta, with like these giant kind of circular noodles, almost like ravioli, but not close, and then another cannoli, which I didn't even get to try. But um, This is in Terramina as well, it's a Greek theater, so it was built, I wrote notes, um, it was built in 3rd century BC, um, and it's called the Teatro Greco, and it involved moving manually over 100,000 cubic meters of rock off the hillside to, like, build it in. So pretty insane. You can't really tell from this photo, this photo is kind of uh, not great resolution anyways, but um, in the back like where the clouds are there is Mount Etna. So you can see it on a clear day from the theater. And that's just another photo of kind of the steps and uh, that would be the, the front view again. Again, if it wasn't cloudy you might be able to see Etna. Uh, so we, when we were there we noticed these they have a really big ceramics industry there. They have amazing, beautiful ceramics. Um, but everywhere we went, we were seeing these little shapes. We didn't know what they were. Um, so we thought on our last day, we had some free time. We would go shopping. And we thought it'd be kind of cool to take some sort of ceramic home. And because we'd seen these everywhere in different colors and different shapes, we thought we might get one of those. So then we found this ceramic shop. and. The sign says, according to Sicilian tradition, the pine cone, symbol of fortune, prosperity, and abundance, decorated the entrances of arist aristocratic houses as a token of hospitality. So we figured we better get one of those. And um, <laughs> now it sits near the entrance of my home. Um, 
that thing weighs like 25, 30 pounds, and I had it in my backpack, and I took three different flights, no, four flights to get home. Like, uh, worst decision ever, but I do love it. So whatever, I guess it was worth it in the end. And then this is just a photo of uh, the beautiful view from Taramina of the sea, and that's all.